formula where business can continue and prosper and poor people don't have to pay the price with their lives. May I now uh, welcome Dr. Hamid and Mr. Veer Sangvi onto the stage for a discussion, which will be followed by a question and answer session. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, you can, great. I'm sorry I'm not used to these foreign ministry type seminar rooms. Okay, Dr. Amit, let me start by saying that was an incredibly powerful film. And I think most people in the room, and I certainly speak for myself, were struck by something you said, which is that if it is possible to prevent the deaths of people and you don't do it, mainly because you want to make money, that's genocide. You want to expand on that? If you are in the healthcare business or you produce medicines for healthcare, I think you cannot look at it only as a business. You're saving lives. Okay. So there has to be a humanitarian basis for producing medicines as well, not just uh, profits, etc. I, I also feel that what we did and what you saw in the film was what we did legally. We as a company, we abide by the laws of the land. We do not break laws. And the one word in the film that really, uh, uh, I think all of you should really consider seriously is that there should not be a sequel. And uh, this is one of the things, because in the drug industry, there is obsolescence. Drugs, now the drug that the film was all about, the first uh, anti-retroviral that Cipla provided to Africa was called Triamune. Now Triamune is not used anymore, 10 years later. There are better and improved versions of and cocktails uh, which you just take one tablet a day. And uh, even those we are selling at below $100 a year. But what happens that after 2005, when India has now part of WTO, we cannot produce the newer drugs uh, because they are now under monopoly. And I think uh, now that I'm sitting in Delhi and uh, in, in the capital of India, I think it is important for our Indian government and Indian bureaucracy to, to, to take a stand as to how we can avert the possible sequel to what you have seen this evening. And all of us have to put our heads together and see uh, 
because one of the things that you saw is the absolute power of monopoly. And we cannot afford, the third world cannot afford monopoly. Can I ask you about another statistic in the film that I found very interesting, which was it said that 10 million people died in Africa and in the third world because they couldn't afford AIDS medicines because the prices were kept too high. Do you subscribe to that figure? Yes, because from the time of nine, see when the cocktail was first uh, discovered, 1997, it came into, uh, then and from 97 onwards in Africa alone, two million people were dying of HIV. Mm -hmm. The biggest industry in Africa in that period was making of wooden coffins. It was the best, the biggest industry, which is very, very sad. One but feels sad about it. Ten million people, that's, that's right, four million mi more than were killed in the Holocaust. That's right, two million a year for the next five years is ten million. So what gives me personally a lot of satisfaction that since we started supplying the, the AIDS cocktail uh, after 2001, 2002, I think indirectly India has been responsible for saving at least 10 million lives over this period in the last 10 years. We've saved, India has saved African lives. And uh, because Indian companies are today supplying 92% uh, of the total ARVs that are being produced, formulations in the world. But what happens mm. in the future? Let's debate that. Okay. Let me now sort of, forgive me if this sounds rude, Play Please. devil's advocate. Let me give you the other side of the story. Please do. Which is that you've told us a very powerful story that's emotional. Deaths of millions of people because of AIDS. Everybody sympathizes with that. But you're playing that argument as a way of bypassing a more important issue, which is the issue of intellectual property rights. No, we are not, because... I sincerely believe that originally when intellectual property came into being three, yeah. four hundred years ago, it was between countries that were uh, technological at par. So Germany could take ten patents in America, Americans could take nine patents in Germany. So it was be between technological parity. Today, if you look at the third world, and even India, even you take Russia, can you name me one Russian drug that is available in the world today. So it is only a handful of countries, America, maybe UK, Europe, France, Switzerland, whose drugs are acceptable. I, in my 50 years in CIPLA, have invented drugs, but the medical profession won't use it. You know what they tell me? What? And they looked at my drug, my friends, the medical profession, in, oh, doctor, I mean, if this drug is as good as you say it is, how come Pfizer and Glaxo haven't brought it out before you? So the, the stigma, like you saw yeah. uh, in, in, in the movie, there's also a stigma from the medical profession. And unless that is uh, removed, how do you access newer drugs? You tell me that. So what we are saying today, we respect patents. I'm not saying I'm not against patents. I'm a scientist. But... We cannot have a monopoly. We are willing to pay the originator of drugs a suitable royalty. No, no, no. And Canada had this law from 1969 to 1992. The Canadian government passed a bill called the S-91. You can check it up on the Internet if you want. which said that the Canadians could import or make any drug they wanted and pay the originator a 4% royalty. And I've always said that if it was good enough for the Canadians at that time, why is it not good enough today for India and uh, the developing countries and the third world countries? Why didn't Canada stick with that law? Because they joined NAFTA, pressure from the Americans. And NAFTA was Mexico, America, and yeah. Canada. And one of the conditions uh, to, for Can Canada to join NAFTA was they had to give up S-91. Let me try and summarize it to the extent that I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is, A, the business of making medicines cannot be only about profit.
Correct. It has to be more than just profit. Correct. B, when there is an emergency situation of the kind we saw in Africa, profit must go out of the window because avoiding genocide is our top priority. I think so, and that does not only apply to HIV AIDS. It applies to many, many diseases. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. But I want yeah. to say the third thing you're saying is that you are not saying that a patent regime is useless. You're saying, yes, there should be patents. People who create drugs should be rewarded. But you're saying there is an alternative to the present system. I'm saying they should be suitably rewarded. You can have a royalty system, and no harm in it. If you look at the world's top selling 100 drugs today, yeah. or 750 drugs, 70% 70 of them are made and marketed by countries that did not invent them. Tamiflu, marketed by Roche, was not invented by Roche. It was invented by Gilead. Roche pays a royalty to Gilead. The top-selling AIDS drug, Tenofovir, today was not invented by Gilead. It was invented by, in Czechoslovakia, in a, in a, in a laboratory in Czechoslovakia. And the original patents are Czechoslovakian. They don't get anything out of it. So it's a very, very difficult situation mm -hmm. where uh, today the inventors are not in a position to market the drugs. I'll give you many examples. Give me some. The Japanese are leaders in science. Yeah. They've d made famotidine, diltiazem, norfloxacin, all the latest drugs. But they have no marketing ability. So they have to go with a begging bowl to the big pharma companies, please take our drugs. And all these drugs that I've just named are sold by the big multinational companies and they pay royalty to the Japanese uh, in inventors. So if that they can do it, why can't India uh, do something similar? Or the third world do something similar? See, I'm not a lawyer, so you sure. can ask the lawyers okay. this. I'm more of a scientist, but I do believe that this, something of this nature has to be worked out. Okay. You said, let's try and avoid this in the future. Now, are you, when you talk about giving a reward to people who've invented something and still preserving some kind of patent regime, are we drawing a distinction between life-saving drugs and ordinary drugs, or do you think this applies to everyone? I think it applies not, life-saving is a very uh, difficult term. Okay. I would s say, restricted to vital uh, Im essential drugs. Define an essential drug in this. Well, if I've got a headache, maybe paracetamol is essential for me. If okay. I've got cancer, then maybe uh, capicitabine is essential for me. So it depends on the disease pattern that you have. I mean, look at India today. With the disease pattern in India, with 110 million mental health, 80 million cardiac, 60 million asthmatics, 60 million diabetics, 50 million hepatitis cases. You, you, it's, it's, a, it's a health care crisis. It's a permanent crisis. And now I'll go back to you to what happened on the 14th of November 2001. Okay. When uh, there was a meeting in Doha, maybe some of the people here attended that meeting in Doha when we had the Doha Declaration. And the point 5C of the Doha Declaration clearly states that every country can decide for themselves as to what is a uh, national crisis in healthcare, I'm saying. And uh, this includes HIV, malaria, TB, and other epidemics. Mm -hmm. There were 149 countries at the Doha uh, Convention, and the vote, this was put to the vote, and one, it was unanimous, 149. When it came up for ratification two years later, the USA objected to the words other epidemics. And uh, it was debated, and the other countries said, sorry, it has to be there for an emergency. Suppose there's plague or, or some pneumonia yeah. or something. So they put it to the vote. The vote was 148 to 1. And guess who won? The one vote. And the one was America. Veto. And till today, uh, the, the Doha Convention has not been ratified. So I, I think, again, like it was in the movie, I said in the movie, and I repeat, that I think it is very important for every country to decide what is best for them. 
And for India, I'm begging uh, the Indian government, I've done it for a long, long time, please do uh, what is best for our country. Mm. And uh, we, we, we went away, we fought for 12 years. I personally fought to get Indira Gandhi to change the patent laws in 72. Now what we did, please understand, the patent laws that we changed in 72, we did not change for any other group of products except health care. And okay. what we said, you cannot patent the end product. You can only patent a process to make the end product. And so that's been the subject of a lot of controversy as well, hasn't it? There's always controversy, but that in its wisdom uh, helped the Indian uh, drug industry today so that India today is regarded as the pharmacy capital of the world. And the third world is looking to India. The whole, the, except for the developed countries, nobody looks at India, but at least the developing the third world look at India as a leader in, in, in pharmacy, world leader. And what I've suggested, which was not shown in the movie, was that in September 2000, when we made the initial offer, I offered to the third world free technology to produce antiretroviral drugs. There were 30 health ministers at that meeting five prime ministers from third world countries and nobody took us up on our offer. Much later, only Uganda came forward and, and we have now got a factory in Uganda. And I would like to repeat that if any of the third world countries want a technology to produce drugs, I've offered this technology to the Indian government as well. The Indian government today have half a dozen drug factories in India. Hindustan Antibiotics, IDPL in Hyderabad, Bengal Chemicals, God knows Smith Standard Street. Why not use the public sector uh, drug industry that we have in India today use more usefully? And every year at my company's AGM, I announce that we are willing to provide free technology to the Indian government for any essential drug that they wish to produce in their public sector companies. And, and I, I hope uh, it is taken up. And also, which we were discussing earlier today, that the backbone of the industry is not who makes the tablets that you saw, who mm. makes the raw materials. Yeah. And I think that is where uh, we have to concentrate much, much more. Who provides the basic raw materials that go into that? Now, there are two sort of broad positions in this. One is your position which is that India is the center of the drug industry. It manages to make excellent world quality generics. It doesn't profiteer from it. You're willing to make the technology available to the rest of the world. But there is the other view, and you saw that to some extent in the film, which is that the generics that Indians make are in some way counterfeit on par perhaps with pirated DVDs on the streets of Bangkok or fake Louis Vuitton bags, you know, sort of stuff that can't be trusted, that may look like the real thing, but is dangerous. Is that a fair criticism? They called me a pirate when we started the thing. Yep. A pirate according to their laws. Again, I repeat and repeat and repeat, we abide by the laws of the land. In India, I abide by Indian laws, in Germany, German laws, in America, American laws. But you can't ask me today to apply American laws to India when I'm doing something in India. In Brazil, I, 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 I conform to Brazilian law. Philippines, Filipino law. But what about the quality issue? The suggestion there is that Indian drug companies are not as careful, and we've had cases recently no, no, about no, no, quality no. as they should no, be. No, 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 no. What happens in when the word quality is used very f flippantly, by yep. the way, you have guidelines for quality. If the authorities change the goalposts without informing you, that's not, and then come and inspect, and why aren't you conforming to that? But you never told us. Even in regulatory, Indian regulatory, Japanese regulatory, American, are all different. If I'm selling in India, I abide by Indian FDA laws. If I'm selling in America, I have to abide by American laws. Mm. And these laws and regulations are keeping on changing. 
Every country improves their things, like you know, in other ways of life as well. So if you are improving, I think the, the companies should be informed that uh, laws are there, that you want more stringent laws, and then we abide by it. But I don't think, in all fairness, that Indian companies are willfully breaking any laws. Because please understand that the active ingredient going into a drug, the, the, the cost of that is so low compared to the selling price of the drug that why should one make counterfeit? Where you, where a spurious is, is not spurious and counterfeit, substandard is the word I think you should use. We do not make substandard drugs. Counterfeit and, and piracy is something else that a hole in the wall company in Bihar mm. without any drug license copies my product like you see the handbags. are totally uh, kosher. Okay. Let's move on to trips because the film ends sort of by suggesting that whatever crisis had been averted will probably come back if we go along with trips and, and the WTO. Could you explain to me drugs you think you could, make, you could make if there wasn't this problem? Yes. Now, for example, in HIV alone, there are today three drugs, four drugs, that are being pushed forward and which will come in into therapy in the next two or three years, which we can't produce today. So you're going to get back into a stage of monopoly in HIV. What happens then? You must understand that in drugs, uh, resistance develops and you have to keep on changing the drugs. So you, there's obsolescence of older drugs. Newer drugs take their place. So you have to keep on changing. If I'm blocked from changing, what do I do? It's a very difficult situation, and I think in all fairness... Are there newer drugs that you would like to make? There are make? half a dozen drugs. Give me some examples. Dolutegravir of, uh, in, in for AIDS. For, it's a GSK drug invented in Japan by Shinogi. Okay. It's a license to GSK. Now GSK has made a partnership with Pfizer. It goes under... Uh, Viv, but this, uh, in all fairness to uh, Viv, they have now offered this drug to many companies through a medicine patent pool in Geneva. And probably we will sign up with them that this drug we can make here and offer to about 67 countries. Okay. Since we're on trips. One of the criticisms is, of course, one of quality, but there are other criticisms. That is that Indian laws, when it comes to things like evergreening, compulsory license, are actually rigged in favor of people like you against what you would call big pharma and therefore need to change. No, no, no. I think there's more of a legal uh, aspect, but if you want me to answer the scientific you want me to call murli up here you know? Pardon? you want me to call murli up here if you to... want to ask him yeah. Hi, murli, he will tell you on, on on compulsory licensing better than i can okay come and join us you can introduce yourself better than i can yeah and so i'm murli nilakant and i'm global general counsel at cipla Okay. Tell us about evergreening, compulsory licenses, the criticisms that really we've rigged the system against international companies and in favor of people like yourself. No, evergreening I can answer. Compulsory license All I right. need you, you can take one, okay. one can take each. All right. The Indian government in the patent law which they had to change because of TRIPS introduced uh, a clause called 3D which says that you cannot patent different salts or esters or polymorphs of the parent drug. Uh, this essentially what the Indian government said that minor incremental uh, inventions changes would not be permissible. Now, this is law in India. It is not law in America. It is not law in Europe where you can patent. So uh, the, the international community who wants India to be TRIPS++++ 
are not seeing the light of day because India is already TRIPS plus. The Americans want us to dilute so that they can mark, uh, patent, uh, f have frivolous patents on incremental innovation, which India is not allowing. So the Indian patent law as of today, according to me, is more stricter than the American patent law. And they should also look at it that way. And I think our Commerce Minister some time ago made that statement and told the Americans that you should uh, look at our law as being much stronger than your law because we are not allowing frivolous inventions to be uh, patented. So I think all, all the developing countries and uh, the third world countries should really follow India's example on that. And India, in fact, we won the case in the Supreme Court against Novartis on this very issue. But uh, we, I yeah. think the way to look at it is the principle of evergreening in the is now quite bad throughout the world. All right. And we're seeing it in Europe as well, where they're looking at interpreting their existing patent law to say that we will not allow evergreening. So it is not a concept that is unique to India, unique to the developing world. This concept has now gone to Europe. Uh, in October last year, an Italian court said they will not allow evergreening. So this is not an Indian view of the world, it's not a third world view of the world. I think there is realization that lots of drug companies are effectively extending lives of products. So with small changes, hmm. you continue to perpetuate the monopoly beyond the patent. So you create a little change, extend the patent by another 15 years. So the real life of a drug now is almost 50 years. And you're keeping everybody out from that monopolistic market for more than one generation. So that is the issue with evergreening. It is not unique to India. A principle exists right. in most parts of the world. And they're coming around to the fact that it's a good thing to stop evergreening. What about compulsory licenses? I think you'll first have to explain what they are and then tell me why, why we're doing the right thing. Uh, so let me put it to you this way. If you had a monopoly but chose not to produce the product and instead allowed, allowed no one else to produce it as, as well, you're creating a situation where nobody can produce this essential product. You don't do it and you don't allow anyone else to do it. That's what a patent does. Hmm. That's not good for the market. And therefore, a way of cracking the monopoly and making sure a monopolist doesn't hurt the market is to say, that's fine. You don't have to produce it, but I will get someone else to produce it and ensure you get paid a royalty. I look at it differently. You've got this nice plot of land, mm -hmm. which you own. You grow roses on it. I'm paying you money to look at the roses. Mm -hmm. How is that a bad thing for someone who owns the land? I'm not taking anything away from you. You're the person with the patent, the plot of land. All I'm doing is saying, I'll pay you a royalty for the pleasure of looking at your roses. To me, I look at that no differently from a compulsory license. I'm not taking anything away from anyone. And it is the threat of compulsory licenses that ensures the monopolist cannot price at will. And we've seen that in the movie you saw yeah. how they dealt with Ciprox. It's the same story with everything else. If you can do it for every other business, where there is a monopoly. We do it, in Europe, we did it for telephones. We did it for electricity. We did it for gas, all monopolies. We forced them to get into a competing market. Hmm. And look at the price of telecom services today, transatlantic. You look at the price of gas. If you can do it for things like software, shouldn't you be doing it for drugs where lives matter? You can do it for phones. We've got FRAND, which is that you can force companies to license out patents for telephones and you allowed them to do that mm. so what is the big issue with life-saving medicines if you can do it for video games mm. why can't you do it for medicines this is one thing and then yeah. i'll just give one i want to throw it open but you no, no, one yeah. live example of what i meant by earlier we talked evergreening the aids example that the first when we started in AIDS drugs, myself in 1991, the first drug and the only drug available was a drug called AZT. Mm. And the story of AZT is very interesting. AZT was first invented in 1963, not for AIDS. 
the use of AZT for AIDS came up in 1985. It was patented, usage patent. There's a usage patent as well in 1985. So that patent was valid till 2005. Nobody could do AIDS, uh, AZT except Burroughs Welcome. Then what happens, uh, Burroughs Welcome got bought out by Glaxo. Then what happened around 2003, Glaxo turns around and, and in 1997, they took out a patent on a combination of AZT and Lamivudine. And then they said that AZT by itself is useless, should not be allowed. So the combo patent is valid till 2017 mm. today. So indirectly and directly, a drug discovered in 1963 is sold under monopoly till 2017, 54 years of monopoly. Now, is that what patenting is all about? No. That's my... It's a powerful so, argument. Yeah. Let me throw that open. Anybody wants... Sir, we're going to give you a microphone. So, may I request you to identify yourself before you ask your question? My name is Kuwaito Sos. I am the ambassador of Cuba. I know how the doctor feel because I am the ambassador of one country who have the most durable blockade, economical, financial, and trade by the superpower of the world, by the United States. And uh, before to say anything, we are very grateful and glad that we have a fantastic relation and historical relation with the India, and we have also a very good relation with the pharmaceutical industry in India. We have people who live in Cuba and save life in Cuba because companies like CIPLA and other companies give to us the possibility to buy in a reasonable prices, the raw material to produce our drugs. The relations in the field of uh, biotechnology and uh, medicines between India and Cuba are very strong. Right now we have a joint venture with Biocom and we are in the process to put in the market some drugs who can fight some types of cancer. I live in, in Africa uh, as a soldier to fight the apartheid regime. Mm. And uh, the disease created by the exploitation of Africa by the colonial powers is more lethal than the apartheid. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, the, la the lady there. And we'll come to you, sir, right after this. Thank you. My name is uh, Manjula Bhatia. I'm a journalist of Swiss Radio. So um, my uh, question is about uh, the movie we have seen. What has not been shown in the film, uh, and the film has been focusing on uh, South Africa, why there has been such a huge uh, spread of uh, AIDS, and uh, everyone maybe remembers that uh, Tabu Mbeki, the president of South Africa after Mandela, for a long time he has been denying the seriousness, the, 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 um, the fact that I, the, at AIDS was a very serious uh, disease, and he was playing down that uh, very much. And this was not uh, uh, mentioned in the film, and there was made only a, an equation between uh, the uh, Western uh, big companies killing people uh, in Africa. So what, what is your point, ma'am? Your point is that if Mr. But, Mbeki yeah. hadn't said that and the drugs is still continue to be unaffordable, people wouldn't have died? No, no, no. No, she's no that, that the governments have the duty to make... Uh, right. So you're saying the government failed in its duty? Yeah, yeah. first all of all. Right. Yeah. You want to no, answer no. that? No, but can't answer that because uh, what happens happened in South Africa was that the... the President of South Africa at that time, Mbiki, said that AIDS was no disease. Yeah. Now, AIDS per se is no disease. If you are HIV positive, 
what happens, your immunity is low, so you are more susceptible to other diseases. AIDS by itself is no disease. So you, you die then of fungus infection, you die of pneumonia, you die of cancer. But just the term is given AIDS. So I think the whole thing has been misinterpreted. And uh, uh, please bear in mind that I didn't make that film. I'm, uh, I had no part of that film. I think one of the people who made the films is in the audience yeah. here, but that's a separate issue. But uh, it's in made an independent film, and uh, the person who made the film uh, gave his and their point of view. Just to answer your question briefly, mm. about 20 years ago, I gave technology to Cuba to produce some raw materials, APIs, and if Cuba wants help, please come to us again. But you can see the basic point, that it isn't just the Western drug companies. Governments also have a responsibility. I think all countries have a responsibility. Okay. Okay. And Sir, it's okay. I'll yeah, get out of it. I'm Cesar Bonamigo, Deputy uh, Chief of Mission of Brazilian Embassy. Um, well, we are countries uh, who are basically on the same page on this issue. Uh, there was one piece of statistics, which was new for me in the presentation, in the film, which is uh, the funding of research. It's something I had never seen before, and I was a bit surprised. I was thought uh, much of the research was uh, done by private companies. So if you could tell us more about the source of this information and uh, attach it to it. Is this a new front? Uh, do you think... Uh, state development, joint development, can be a new battlefront? It ought to be, because in America, the American government last year spent $31 billion just on drug research. But they do the concept research in the universities. Uh, uh, the two initial drugs for HIV, which was invented in, in, in the in the late uh, 1990s by Yale University, they gave it to Bristol Myers Quibb, who then marketed Stavudine and DDI. And Yale got a royalty from BMS. And Yale were earn was earning 40 to $60 million a year by way of royalties. So the, you, that system in America is a very, very good system of public funded research at the university levels, then what happens with the drug companies, they take up something and then, and then bring it out in the form of a drug. Like today, Gilead has a new drug for hepatitis C. They never invented it. Some uh, uh, other company invented it, they bought out the company. It can happen. Or license the product. So this goes on in the drug industry a lot. Where the concept is that people don't understand the family of drugs. The first beta blocker was concept. After that, by twitching this and twitching that, you get a family of drugs. That, the, to make a family after having the first fundamental concept is easy. And that is where the big pharma take a position. You have the first loss heart end for heart blood pressure. Then you get candy sartan, and you get tell me sartan, and all the sartans come. Now that type of work is quite uh, relatively easier to do. But, so, but I mean the point he's making and the point uh, that struck me also is that the justification for the high price of drugs has always been for every 500 drugs launched, only one drug succeeds. They need this money for R&D and therefore to keep looking at just the cost of the manufacture and the selling price is silly because the money goes into research. That film suggests that that's a lie. You agree with that? I partly agree with it and partly I don't agree with it. Oh, but, explain that. Yeah. But uh, Murli wants to say, say something. So the way you look at it is where is the cost? Okay. So if you say money is spent in R&D, we saw the numbers there. Right. Money is not actually spent in R&D. Money is spent in creating a regulatory barrier which makes it impossible for someone to compete with you. So I go and buy a drug 
I pay 50 million for it. Then I create a barrier for anyone else to get a regulatory approval or challenge a patent. That's approximately 100 million in cost. So effectively, to have a seat at the table to compete with someone, mm. need to have a willingness to pay between 100 and 150 million just to take a look at the cards. Okay. So basically, then, you're agreeing with the film then? I am. You are. And we've got so why are you disagreeing with part of it? No, because science has to be ongoing. Yeah. Okay. And like the gentleman said here just now, I think governments have to play a very active role in the development of that science and participate in it like the American government does. Hats off to them that they spend themselves $31 billion. Uh, the two ladies sitting there uh, connected with in the Department of Pharmaceuticals in India, I'd like to know how much does the Indian government spend in drug research in India? What has happened to the public sector factories that the Indian government created 20, 30 years ago? They've all, all, all shut down. So something is basically yeah. wrong. And I think what we need, at least in India, I'm an Indian and a very national Indian. Yeah. And I'd like to see India develop. And, and any help the government wants from so-called successful Indian drug companies, all of us are willing to come forward and help India uh, uh, attain um, better health, uh, health care. Okay. So taking off from the gentleman's question, yes, governments must get more involved in research. That is perhaps the way forward that happens in America. Perhaps it doesn't happen enough in India and we should do it. But as for this business that they have to charge us high prices because they spend money on R&D, that's not really valid. No, 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 no. Charging high and reasonable prices is uh, a question of value. Just now, this new hepatitis C drug you yeah. read about in the press, Sophos Bouvir of Gilead, is priced at $1,000 per tablet. If I could make it, I assure you I would give it for $10 a tablet or less. So, but that's so a this, separate but issue. Is what, but but this why is what do they, gets me. Yeah, but how do they, how do how do they, they arrive, get, at the figure of arrive at the figure of 1,000? How? Because they go to the insurance companies and they say, look, you insure patients who are HI, uh, who are, who've got hepatitis C. What does it cost you for one patient of hepatitis C per year? And the insurance companies say it costs us $168,000 to look after one patient. So the company then says, if we give you a course of 84 tablets at $84,000, and it's secure, so the insurance companies jump at it. Now that is meant for the United States. So I don't want to sp spoil that. I don't. Good luck to them. So every country has to decide what they want. Now, uh, Sophos Bouvier was not patented in Egypt, and suddenly. The company then goes to Egypt. Are you willing to pay four and a half thousand for a course of this drug? So that is the price in Egypt. Now, in some country, uh, if if say Cuba develops a synthesis of this drug and markets it in Cuba, they could give it for two hundred dollars. Okay. Eighty-four tablets. So basically, they sort of make it up as you, they go you along. You price a product on value. And the value no. is different in different countries. But not on cost. Not on cost. The cost has nothing to do oh. with drug industry. Yeah. Two questions. The gentleman there, or the lady first, all right? Please go on. Um, Could you stand I, up, please? I'm Rashmi Saxena. I'm a journalist. This one question, uh, which is more of a clarification, actually. You said that because of the new laws and trips, there are certain drugs which you could manufacture in India at a lower cost and you cannot. Which are the uh, diseases we are looking at when it comes to these drugs? That's a very good Thank question. You. Very good question. There are some in HIV today, some two or three new drugs in HIV, many, many drugs in cancer one could produce cheaply. We've been, we've been in court, my company has been in court in the last two, three years to get some of the patents revoked. We have won some cases. Uh, TB, 
There's for resistant TB, there are a couple of new drugs that have come up internationally we cannot produce. So there's TB, HIV, cancer, which is, uh, which is under today, at least among the diseases that I know of. So cancer is, 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 is ter terrific. We won a case last year against Novartis on the cancer drug, again on the question of evergreening, et cetera. And uh, essentially, number of cancer drugs that are sold at three, three lakhs per month, we are offering at 6,000 a month. So it makes a very big difference. So my question, again, I, it's something that is, I'm not supposed to talk about, but the government of India has a system of price control. I don't want to criticize the government on their price control, but I have said so publicly, so I'm repeating this, that if you're having price control, you should have price control on drugs that are sold under monopoly. To have price control on drugs that are made by 20 or 30 companies, where free competition, the only way prices will come down in any country is by free and open competition. That is the only way you bring down prices. You cannot bring down prices by monopoly. So what I suggested to the Indian government, you have a price control system for monopoly drugs, drugs that, that are only sold by one or two companies in India. The rest where there are today 175 brands of the drug that was pointed out, Cipro for anthrax. What are you putting it under price control? The normal water finds its own level. So you're saying let the market find it? Let the market find But for the monopoly drugs, you do something. The gentleman there. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Awad from uh, Sana, Bureau Chief, South Asia Bureau Chief of Syrian Arab News Agency. Uh, the question is, is the price is when it comes to medicine, you have to give everything on the cover, the composition, so it's easy to, to, uh, to develop the same. My question is, what is, uh, why can't you look onto a joint venture of productivity, especially for essential drugs, and with the giant company like they are doing for certain products for the cheap labor in India? That's a very good question. Mm. But I have myself gone with a begging bowl to one or two of the big companies to give us products, at least for India, at, at least. Believe me, is not so easy. And uh, we have signed up with one international company for one of the antiretroviral drugs. The, we are now following a, a system, in my, at least in my company, that if we cannot win the battle of patents, like we have challenged so many patents, and we'll continue to challenge unrealistic patents or frivolous patents, then it is best to join hands with the big pharma companies and do something jointly. Uh, it is easier said than done, but we are definitely, or Indian companies are definitely following your suggestion. Okay. But they are restricting you to the countries, they're restricting you to what you can do or not do, etc., etc. So it's not all that easy, okay. but we are going ahead and doing it. Are you optimistic? No, no, but right. no, no, no. For certain products, yes. I can't say uh, I'm optimistic for certain products, but not down the line that I can get any product I want. Because, uh, like, for example, Johnson & Johnson on the anti-TB, uh, the new TB drug that they have for, they, they've said, sorry, for India, we want to do it ourselves in India. We have a company in India. We want to market it, and we're not giving it to anybody in India. What can I do? Nothing. Okay. So it, it varies company to company, product to product. It's, there's no hard and fast. Okay. The gentleman there had his hand up first. I'll come to you, Pastor Rekha, next. Um, so the big farmer... Sir, could you please identify yourself? Uh, my name is Manish Chan. I'm a journalist. I represent India Rights Network. The big farmer industry says India's approach to creating a national list of essential medicines with controlled pricing is the wrong way to go. 
Instead, this suggests a tiered system of pricing to ensure access to medicine for the poorest of the poor. That is my first question. My second question is the film compellingly brings out the, the geopolitics of the drug industry, you know, the north-south divide, where governments are becoming handmaidens of corporate big pharma industry. What is the way out? Because this is such an entrenched process. Nothing will move if the government, this way of doing business uh, doesn't change. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take this first to Murli. This business about the tiered system has been talked about a lot. Yeah. The argument is you keep telling us poor people can't afford our medicines, but why are we subsidizing your rich people as well? So you think a tiered system is a possibility? I think if you let the market decide, so let's look at uh, what you want to price. A tiered system makes sense where there is a monopolistic buyer. So if you okay. go to the UK or Europe, the government is the sole provider of health services. Right. They can then decide whether the poor need to pay the same as the rich. That story does not exist in India. Hmm. There is no central buyer of these products. And therefore, to say, I will buy from the pharmaceutical industry, and then we will decide at what price the actual user gets the service. You're and saying who will do the buying and then decide. Exactly. So okay. unless you have a central, okay, the only way you can achieve it in India is to follow a European model, which is free N health care for all. A national, point of, a national health service. Yeah. A free health care at the point of person. So, you you think it's not going to, so your objection is not going to work because we don't have an NHS. We don't have an NHS. In fact, even central government employees, for example, don't have a lot of uh, medicines on their list. Yeah. So even when the government does procure for employee state insurance, central government health service, there's a lot of essential medicines not on that list. So even government servants are not doing justice to their own brethren, okay. where they're denied medicines that they could have had. But your argument now is a practical one. What about the argument of principle, which is that you use the example of per to force us to sell our medicines cheap, where actually your rich Indians who could well afford to pay international prices are also getting them cheap undeservedly? I agree with that. You agree with I that? I completely agree. And I'm saying it as a person who's had to use some of these drugs, very okay. expensive drugs, and haven't paid for it. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that it is absolutely right. But the only way you can fix it is by ensuring okay. at the point of yeah. impact, which is the individual, you can do it. You can't do it by saying Sipla will price in different shops so that Veer and Murli can go and access X shops and the rest of the world can access Y shops and we'll have a differential pricing. The model doesn't lend itself to differential pricing in this country. But you've left the door open because if they could find a model, you'd have to support it. That would absolutely be right. 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 Okay. Patrile. Writing on health and related development issues. Um, questions to Dr. Hamid. Dr. Hamid, uh, for our India's independent patent regime, we are now in pretty deep. Uh, sticky waters. We are on the priority watch list of the United States and uh, many other countries, uh, and I think big fear is that other countries are following our example Brazil, uh, South Africa so what should India do? I mean there are trade-offs and pretty serious trade-offs. Uh, let me try and answer that while he's doing it. Okay. So I don't think uh, we should get very excited by what's happening with 301. We've been on that list ever since it started. I don't think a lot has changed. Uh, with the WTO regime, the UN can't do much about imposing sanctions on us. Uh, they have an they've given an undertaking to the WTO that they will not take unilateral measures. So I think it's a process that the US has to follow. Uh, there is a lobbying process. The pharma lobby is the largest lobbying group in the US, uh, much bigger than the next two, which are uh, oil and uh, tobacco. And you expect that that constituency, which is the pharma lobby, needs to have a voice somewhere. But there's no action that's likely to come out of that in this year or the next uh, that we should be worried about. So to the extent that what we have said, and we've had very good reaction to the 301 process at least this year, I think a lot more countries like Brazil uh, and Europe, there are European countries on that list, will look at it and say, we're not going to be scared of the United States. You know, they have a view of what the regime should be in other parts of the world. They themselves don't subscribe to that view. So several of the things they are asking of us are not part of U.S. law themselves. So they are asking us to comply with the regime or do things which they themselves don't do. No, but may I 
Okay. Interrupt so, uh, you on this. That's the last thing I've got. Okay. La I'm now 15 minutes over time no, already. Yeah. One question to her was, yeah. until 1989, we followed GATT, which was the general uh, agreement for trades and yeah, tariffs. Yeah. And suddenly then the Americans and the Europeans and the developed world says intellectual property should be part of GATT. That came around in 1989. India then agreed to it very reluctantly, although Dinesh Singh, the then Commerce Minister, opposed it tooth and nail. But God knows what happened, but that's another story. Then came the Dunkel draft and the trips came in. India joined in 1995. What was our business? I remember in Parliament here, the Minister of Commerce turned around and said that India today has 0.2% of world trade. I would like the Indian government to tell us what is the percentage of world trade that India has today. And he said, Maran was the uh, minister at the time, mm -hmm. he said it will take us 10 years to reach 1% of the world trade. I mean, how important is WTO to India? Huh? It's not important to China. Russia were not members till recently. So there is a possibility, I think, India, in, if India really woke up and became an economic power in its own right, would tell the WTO, thank you very much, we don't want to be a member anymore and go back to our 1972 patent regime. So I think, Patrulekha, the answer to your question is they're not worried and they don't think India should be either. <laughs> right, Rezeban, we're already Last, 15... You're, you were asking something? No, I said I'm already 15 oh, minutes yeah, over time. I don't okay, care. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Muli, thank you so much for clarifying issues. And Dr. Amit, always a pleasure to listen to a legend. Anytime. I think she's going to say thank you things. so much, uh, Dr. Hamid and um, Mr. Sangvi. We also like to thank uh, Romana Gray, the producer of the film, for coordinating the event with us. Do we get a drink now or something? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> we, uh, we have a reception. We are requested to join All right. us. All right. Thanks. Thank you.